but hey, uh, I'm gonna show you how error handling works in Go. If you have come from a different programming language, you know, probably one of the things that will rub you the wrong way is how error handling works in Go. But I'm gonna show you that it works and it's just a little bit different than what you're used to. And if you follow the right idioms, uh, it can work really well. I think you'll find that Go programmers really enjoy the way error handling works in Go, even though it's different than what you might find in Java or C Sharp or anywhere with exception handling. So this article written by my colleague, Brandon, also fellow Ontarioan, terrific. Let's go through it. So in Go, an error is anything that implements this interface. It's a very simple interface, right? All you have to do to implement this interface is have an error method that returns a string. That's it. So if you do that, you're set. The, the simplest way to construct errors, you don't even implement that interface yourself. All you do is import this errors package and then do errors.new and give it the string. And then that's going to return an error, something that, you know, when you call error on it, will return the string that you passed in. Something didn't work. Simple enough. The thing you should realize, right, is these are errors. They're just normal types that implement that interface. They're not exceptions. You don't throw them. Here's some code. You return an error just like you return anything else. There's nothing particularly magic about how errors work in Go. It follows the, the same format as everything else. So here I have this method divide and it takes in two integers, A and B. And then since this can fail, if I try to divide by zero, there's an error case. I need to return the result, but also return an error if something goes wrong. There's no sum types in, in Go, which I would enjoy. So you always are returning both of these and then the person who calls it needs to check whether there is an error. And this actually works surprisingly well once you get used to it. So here's the implementation, right? I am going to check if B equals zero. And if so, when I return this pair, I'm gonna return the zero value for whatever this type is, which in this case is literally zero. And then I'm gonna return my error. The way I'm returning an error right here is I've imported this FMT package, which is format. And then I have formatted an error message to return, right? Using this D for numbers, which will insert my A value. So it'll say like, hey, you can't divide three by zero. That will be the returned message. If I pass in three, zero. If I pass in three, one, it's gonna return three over one and return a nil error message. Nil is the zero value of our error type. And so you just have to track this as you call things. If it can return an error, then you need to handle it. So this is a, a very common way to return errors. And we're gonna show you uh, later on, spoiler alert, how you can use this to wrap errors and build up something uh, similar to a stack trace. But as Brandon explains in this, when you are dealing with nil errors, what you need to do is in your calling code, check if the error is nil. And that uh, kind of gives you a try catch type functionality, except it's only at the next level up. You have to explicitly handle that. You may be thinking, well, what if there's a bunch of different types of errors that get returned? Like, you know, this is the simplest code possible, but there could be eight different paths and eight different ways things go wrong. And how, when I call this, do I figure out which one is the one that went wrong? If all I have is a string, I'm not going to like pull this apart. And here it's even a dynamic string. I'm not going to like regex does it start with can't divide and say that's a can't divide error. That doesn't make any sense. Better way, right? The simplest way to deal with that is to, to just declare the variables, explicit types that you want to use. So here, all I'm doing is I'm giving a name to my error, error divide by zero. I still use the same like errors.new to set a string. And then in my divide method, I just return that explicitly, which makes it easy in my code. Oh yeah, here is an example of calling this, by the way. So I have my two variables and then I'm gonna call divide, right? With A and B, I'm gonna get two return results back, right? This one being the error. I'm gonna check if the error is null and then I wanna see what type of error it is, right? And here's where I use error is, which lets me check if the error is equal to that type or if it's wrapped if that type wraps it, which we'll get to later. So this lets us pull it apart, right? So now we're getting kind of this feel that I'm used to from when I learned Java in university and it's like try and then catch a IO exception and catch a DNS exception and catch a general exception, right? We can check the various types that are returned this way. So that is one way, right? To be explicit as a type of error. This is what Brandon and I guess anyone would call a sentinel. It's a specific value marking something. 
It's a Sentinel error. You can do more than that though, right? You can do a custom error type. In this specific case, we're just dividing by zero. It's not the most involved error case, but let's pretend that we want to carry along more information with our error, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make our own type called division error. And in it, we're gonna store A, we're gonna store B, and we're gonna store our message. And then to make this into an error, right, we have to implement that error interface. So this is how we do that. We're gonna say return error message for division errors, right? So now division error is an error, it implements this interface. Now, in our divide, rather than returning that specific Sentinel value, which you know we can't store values in, it's just a, a global singleton, we can create a new division error set into it our formatted message to say whatever we want as well as set our int a and int b which means when we get down here here's my main method right i'm doing all the same stuff as before but now i'm going to use error.as so error.as we've declared a division error and then we're going to use error.as to say hey can the error returned be treated as a division error and it'll say oh yes it can this will return true it will set this value and then now that we have these values set from these values returned up here, we can do whatever we want with them, right? We can pull apart int A, int B, use the messages. And so this is a way to kind of have more information in our errors that we want to bubble up. And then of course, if it's not that case, we're just going to handle that here. I mean, in this case, in all of these, there's not really much else that could go wrong here, but in, in actual code, you probably have a number of code paths and maybe there's just one specific case you want to handle specifically and then the other cases you want to handle more generically and so it does make sense to have a default right to cover all your options this works great if we need more specific information but there is a case we're not covering let me show you let's say we have database we have users in it and we have some code that deals with that right so we have this user struct and we have these methods find user right and then set user age and you can see from the return type, find user will return a user, but it can also return an error if something goes wrong. Set user age, you know, we pass it a user and an age, and it's going to try to make a database update, right? But that can also error out. Okay, this is fine. Here's where it's not fine. We build up some more complicated code, right? So here's our implementation of find user, our implementation of set user, and then we have find and set user age, which calls find user, calls set user, and then if everything's all right, then it just returns nil, there's no error, right? We're calling this for the side effects, right? So if there's no error, that's good. If something does go wrong, either in find user or set user, we're gonna return an error. Here's why this isn't perfect. When we call find user, uh, sorry, find and set user age with Bob and 21, either of these could return an error and we don't have a way to tell which one's which, right? Like if this returns a DB error and this returns a DB error, we can't tell if the error came from set user age or from find user. The, the return is the same. And it could be that these both return a connection string not found error, right? It could be the same error. We need a way to tell where it came from. We, we need to kind of be able to tell the type, but also the path, right? That this error came from. Something like a stack trace that you might expect if you were doing a throw. And wrapping errors is the way that we do that. So let's improve upon this code. Right? I mean, this works, but uh, debugging, not ideal. So that's why, as Brandon outlines in this article, which you should read, in Go 1.13, they added wrapped errors. So wrapped errors still use this method we've been using, this format.errorf, but we can use the verb w to wrap. And when we use w, we have to pass into it a, an error. We're making a new error wrapping the old error, kind of building up a stack trace, but instead it's a nested group of errors as we explicitly handle our exceptions up the call stack. Let me show you what I mean. So here's our find user again. It can return an error. And when we get it an error from it, we're not going to just return it or return our own new error. Instead, we're going to wrap the existing error. So we're going to add this new message, find user, fail executing query, and then we're going to add W here, which is going to have the result of making a string that combines both of these um, but in implementation wise, it's actually nesting one inside the other, uh, which you'll see in a moment. Same for set user age, right? We're gonna do the same trick here where we pass the error in. And then we can even do it at this level, find and set user age, we're going to wrap the error here, right? So you can see we're explicitly handling the error at each level 
and kind of adding a message that's more specific about what happened. And that means when we come down here and we actually, you know, run this, we get an error back, we'll get an error message that looks like this. So we'll get this failed finding or updating user, right? Which comes from here. And then we'll get find and set user age, which comes from here and then set user age. So that tells us we're here. So we can now see the problem happened here, right? Not here. And so that's just reading the text message. Just reading the text, the string that's returned by an error lets us tell where, uh, you know, the, the path that the error bubbled up from. Um, but it's not just string concatenation that's happening here. It is literally wrapping one error in the other. And the way that we can tell that is this error is. I don't think he has an example of it, but let me show you. So here, when we say error is error divided by zero, this isn't only checking for direct identity, it will also return true if this error here contains wrapped inside of it, the error divided by zero, which means that each of these levels, when we do a wrap, we're not losing this information that the original error was error divided by zero. We can still pull that apart, even though it's several levels down the error wrapping return stack. And it's the same for the error as. When we do error as here, it's not just the current error, but if we had wrapped it, that would also work as well. So that kind of lets us unwrap those errors and therefore pull things apart the same way you might expect in some place with a try catch, just a little bit of a different and more explicit mechanism. Yeah, so that's wrapping errors. And you can see, like, I'm, I'm not a Go guru. I think the complaint that people have about this error checking mechanism is that there's a lot of this, right? if error does not equal to nil return this, right? A lot of explicit checking and wrapping. But the beauty part of it is that it's very explicit, right? And it's very simple. There's, there's nothing magic here. An error type is just any type that implements that interface. There's nothing magical. It's returned just like anything else. And we just have some idioms you know, some ways that we do things as as Go programmers, as developers to to handle these things, but there's no magic, right? We can just explicitly read through and understand what's happening here. This can return an error. And when it does, you know, we'll check for it here and then we'll return our own error, which we just append this message on. The nice thing uh, about the way that this works is it's very explicit. When I was a C Sharp developer, you could you know, throw an exception three levels down and catch it five levels up. And, and that was handy for a lot of cases. But if you're looking at some of that code in the middle, it's not absolutely clear that there are these errors that could be, you know, bubbling up from any point and jumping right by all this code. Sure, it's nice to have a stack trace, but this explicit way that it is done in Go actually works pretty well. And I think it's something you have to give it a try, get a feel for how it works. Yeah, so that is how you do error handling in Go. You explicitly return it and wrap it. And it's a little bit more typing, but I think you'll find it works pretty well. Also, if you want to learn more about Go, you should check out some of the other videos I made. There's one about using make files, some great videos about Python too. But yeah, I think you might like some of the Go ones that I've created. And if you like this video, check out Earthly. This is the Earthly website we're looking at right here. Earthly helps make your builds simpler. It works great with Go. It's great for abstracting system level dependencies. It's like Docker, but for builds. And I think if you like this video, you'd really like it. So, so check it out. Thank you.